And I'm going to give this talk together with Jason Gibson because he's done a significant amount of that work. I'm going to also have a live presentation of our potential as part of it. And the talk, as you're going to see, is actually going to connect to some of the earlier talks, including the first talk of the workshop by uh, Jörg and then by Jan, because we've actually followed their advice and included some pi iron in our workflow by now. So I'm going to tell you about some of our workflow components for the discovery of novel superconductors. And uh, as we've already heard uh, many times, if you want to design and discover new materials, machine learning and artificial intelligence is a nice way of accelerating those efforts. I'm going to actually try to talk, talk to you about three projects. Uh, the first one is uh, data augmentation. The second one is uh, ultra-fast potential. For the data augmentation, we're going to show you that we can actually have, do a very cheap data augmentation, uh, essentially for free, to uh, come up uh, with a better way of predicting the re relaxed energy of unrelaxed structures, something that's needed in our workflow. In the second part, I'm going to talk about ultra-fast potentials. Uh, that's a machine learning potential method, which we think is one of the fastest, is probably competitive in speed, speed with ACE, as we've heard earlier and uh, has a surprisingly good accuracy, and the design principle was interpretable uh, machine learning potentials. I'll tell you more about that. And the last part we may not get to, I might just only give you a one slide summary, is that we're using symbolic regression and data augmentation to actually discover new physical equations describing the superconducting critical temperature as a function of the electron phonon spectral function. So let me tell you first who's actually been part of the work. A number of the names were already on the first slide, but there wasn't enough space to put everybody on there. In blue are all the theorists that have contributed in various ways to the work. Uh, in red are our experimental superconductivity team. Uh, we also have taken extensive advantage of IPAM, as well as the quantum theory project at UF, and of our computational resources. We're really lucky at the University of Florida that NVIDIA has invested heavily there and has worked together with the state of Florida to build the Hypergator 3.0. Our AI machine, which has 1,100 E100 GPUs, is, uh, was in the top 20 of the top 500 last year, is number three ranked supercomputer in higher education worldwide, and we have really some fun resources there. We've got to thank the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, for a lot of uh, the financial support. And I want to just point out that some of the work I'm presenting today started actually at IPEM in 2017 on complex energy landscape. It really started taking off in 2019 when Stephen Chi and I uh, were together with Matthias Rupp and we stayed at the same place and we uh, developed the UF3 method. And now it continues uh, with the new mathematic on exascales. And we're now trying to put it all together with these workflows such as pi iron, uh, flex, and others. I want to use the first few minutes of my talk to kind of sort of give you a little bit of a historical background also where the community and maybe specifically I came from when it comes to computational materials discovery and design. And so I'm from the last century, and in the last century <laughs> we did materials discovery a little different. I should probably also point out my wife insisted that I wear my uh, Disney birthday badge. It's also my birthday and happy Cinco de Mayo to everybody. So yeah, I really am from the last century. <laughs> Thank you. And so back then, we did materials discovery by trial and error. This was almost exclusively experimental, the discovery, and it was based on intuition and some of those empirical rules, hume rutherford rules, Pauling rules, and there's many others. And if you don't know about them, ask about me about them afterwards. They're actually still good guiding principles, but machine learning has certainly overcome many of those. And we typically explored material space near known compounds and alloys. And so any kind of breakthrough discovery, if you look back, were really essentially mistakes or accidents. So quasi-crystals in the mid-80s were discovered in some diffraction patterns, and people didn't believe that they were really five-fold symmetric structures and lots of arguments. The cuprate superconductors, similarly, were essentially accidents. And the magnesium diboride, which was on the shelf for a long time before people realized it's superconducting, uh, and graphene done by scotch tape, and exfoliation had actually already been synthesized in the 70s on substrates, and they were really just discovered by accident. I'm going to show you here one example for how we worked in the last century. This was published this century, but the work was done a little earlier, uh, uh, to describing quasi-crystal structures where we actually did combine, finally, theory and experiment. So Rietveld like refinement of X-ray and neutron combined, and then we had multiple unit cells in these quasi-crystalline structures to figure out how do you get to those 
five-fold symmetric icosahedral quasi-crystals. And so the lessons we've learned uh, as a community from this work in the last century is really that in order to have an impact, the calculations have to be faster than experiment. It's not helping the experimentalist if two or three years after they've published the paper, you tell them, hey, you were right. Uh, <laughs> not, not good. So we've got to be faster. Software has to be available. It really need, means you've got to download software. It should be open source uh, software that we understand what's going on. We've got to share all this stuff. We also got to share hardware and we got to share data across the community. And there's really a need for advanced computational algorithm. And all this is what we have been doing as a community over the last 20 years, essentially the beginning of this century. And so we're really in a new era of materials discovery. And this slide I'm really just browsing through. We're riding on the wave of exponential growth of computational power. And that wave seems to be going on. It is fantastic. We have changed, and all these are developments over again the last 20 years, towards open source and community software development. Every single talk I believe we saw today had GitHub mentioned on there where the software, the data, et cetera, is available. And that's just fantastic. I did not grow up in science that way. People really held this stuff back quite a bit, and I love it that we can share. And uh, you see all the other tools here. Uh, high throughput simulations and computational databases. I'm going to talk a little bit later on. I mentioned it's a materials project, but there's, of course, many others. Nomad, OQMD, Aflow, our own materials web, and many more I don't mention here. And then, since I'm interested in structure discovery, I have to say a few words about genetic algorithms, and I'm going to come back to that. And there's many genetic uh, algorithms or structure prediction algorithms available. Crystal Opt, uh, Calypso, and our own gas code. And all of those, again, with documentation and examples, you just go to GitHub, download them. Many, some of them are written in Python. Really easy to implement in your workflow. It's fun. So we've changed, in other words, how we discover materials by actually having these better software tools, by sharing them, et cetera, and sharing computational resources. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of materials that were discovered. And these are really biased examples, because they're examples from my own group. Uh, so, but there's, in many research groups, similar types of examples. So the first example here, this was a discovery done by Dan Friedemann. He was an undergraduate. He was actually a freshman in the group. And he said, hey, I would like to just see if we can do, learn some DFT calculation. Do you have a sensible project? And we worked with uh, people at Los Alamos. And they said, hey, we have a system we're interested in. It's cerium, iridium, indium. And we think there may be an interesting material in there, which may even be a new superconductor. And I said, that sounds great. So let's take a look at that. And so Dan sat down, and uh, I ta taught him about ternary phase diagram, the Gibbs triangle he had learned about in material science. And he calculated with VASP the energy, the magnetic energy of all these different serum, iridium, indium compounds here. And indeed, found somewhere in the middle here a compound serum, iridium, for indium that was stable. He did that all in the time frame of about maybe a month or two. There were a couple of small mistakes, and after about three months, he had, had this all done. We talked to our people at Los Alamos and said, great. They arc melted the sample. This is their diffraction pattern. They found the material. It's not superconducting. That's OK, but it's a new material that didn't exist before. And uh, it has some interesting properties. It's actually a nice magnetic material, and it leads to a nice publication. A few years later, we had changed gears a little bit and didn't work as much on bulk materials. The 2D materials were super exciting. And I had a wonderful graduate student, Hulang Zhang, who's now a faculty at Arizona State. And he was looking through databases of bulk materials and identified a material, iron-3, germanium, tellurium-2, which looked like it had some Van der Waals bonds in them and might be, we might be able to exfoliate it. And so he set out, calculated the exfoliation energy for that material was sufficiently low, and then looked at the properties of the iron atoms in that structure. The iron atoms are in the center layer here, and the question was, could that be a real ferromagnet? And if you don't know enough about 2D materials yet in magnetism, the big deal in there is, is it an Ising type? easy axis uh, uh, spin the iron has, or is an easy plane? Easy planes are no good because they lead to these costal Saulus transitions, and it's not a true ferromagnetic phase. And so for data storage and other magnetic application, an Ising spin would be better. So we calculated and found that, well, first of all, it's, it's a magnet. It's a, so, and it has an, a stoner instability, and it has an easy axis. So it was really a true ferromagnetic phase transition. We published that. Didn't watch it very long, what happened to the paper, but a few years later, he came back to uh, talk to me. Hey, have you seen what happened to our prediction? And there were about three papers, and there's a, a number more, in slightly higher impact journal than our PRB publication, saying, hey, we made it. It is ferromagnetic. It is interesting for various applications. So it caused quite some stir. 
and uh, we were certainly very happy. I want to talk about superconductors. I want to say we've also discovered a number of superconductors. I'm going to show you one here right now. This is tungsten diboride. And that was based on work by Ajinkya here in our group, who had looked at or uh, calculated the enthalpy versus pressure for the, the WP2 phase in the magnesium diboride structure. And that work was inspired by work by a Chinese group on molybdenum diboride, which had also found superconducting in that phase. He predicted it at about 120 GPA to become stable. And it should be the only superconducting phase out of all the phases we had uh, looked at in that system. Great. The so experimentalist arc melted it. They loaded it in their diamond anvil cells. They squeezed it until the diamonds broke. And they did find it superconducting. But it didn't turn superconducting at 120 GPA. It also never showed a phase transformation, as we predicted. It superconducted at 50 GPA without a phase transformation. Right? It's a reasonable TC. It's about 18 Kelvin uh, when it's there. But can't be the right phase. So what's happening? Well, Ajinkya and I sat down and said, look, what's going on in that system? The, the phases they think is superconducting certainly can't be superconducting in the bulk form. It turned out, or it turns out that's our hypothesis. We have some TEM proof, but it's not quite con uh, as convincing as we like it, that it forms stacking faults. And these stacking faults here in the middle, these are actually the magnesium diboride-like structure. And these are the things that superconduct. So it actually leads to filamentary superconductivity in that phase. And that's something which had not been shown before, that you can have stacking faults being uh, uh, responsible for superconductivity across a bulk phase. So we're excited. We think there's a number of other materials. We have alloyed this phase and made it stable at ambient pressure, and it's still superconducting. And we're looking at a couple other diboroid systems. Yeah, so when you shear the phase we see in the x-ray, when you shear that over, it leads to a specific stacking of the, uh, boron uh, uh, yeah, the boron layers, which flattens them out. And that leads to the right kind of phonons that you need to a high electron phonon coupling. It becomes superconducting. Right? If it was actually this, uh, just the MGB2 phase, the TC would be significantly higher. But because it's not really having the full electron phonon coupling of the bulk phase, the TC is suppressed by what factor 2. But yeah. And so TM sees those stacking faults, but it depends also on the exact stoichiometry. And we're still working with our TM experts on uh, really seeing that these things are indeed making it superconducting. So these were three examples of what's happening there. And these were all based on human intelligence we, uh, we have here. The training for these humans took about 20 years. The workflow, we like to call K to 12, approved by the Department of Education, kindergarten to 12th grade. Well, we have to be a little careful. It's actually not 12th grade. It's K20, kindergarten to postgraduate, essentially, right? And the runtime for the algorithm took about one year after the student was trained, right? So clearly, there's lots of room for improvement. And it's a workflow that works. We all went through that. Uh, but we can do better when we use computers for that. So I'm going to, together with Jason, tell you about something about our AI-driven workflow for materials discovery. For especially for superconductivity. So we always start with mining databases and the literature to identify actually where are there interesting areas in material space where we want to dig a little deeper and figure out could there be some materials with useful properties such as superconductivity. Uh, we often start with the materials project. In addition to reading tons of papers, we have our own databases, materials web. And there are workflows, MP interfaces we've developed. And we're using the VASCODE for many of the calculations for doing some initial kind of screening work. That gives us candidate material systems. In this case, for example, we're looking at boride system. So uh, elemental and uh, binary, ternary, quaternary uh, boride systems. And then we're interested in predicting what structures show up in those binary, ternary, quaternary systems. And to do that, we really like to use genetic algorithms in, like the genetic algorithm for structure prediction gas from our own group. And here's just an illustration of what it does. It's a grand canonical algorithm, and it predicts uh, a convex hull. And in this case, we found a new lithium germanium compound, which was below the convex hull of known lithium germanium compounds. It was a zintel phase. And so we're running that. And this is going to be the main focus of the talk, making this faster. This is, turns out to be relatively slow, because it relies on DFT, on VASP. Once we have these candidate crystal structures, we're usually jumping right into the property prediction. And so we're, in this case, we do electron phonon coupling calculations using quantum espresso and the EPW code and calculate critical, critical temperatures, as well as critical magnetic fields, which turns out to be a very important component of actually applying superconductors. You need to have materials which can have a high critical field before they go back to normal conducting. 
When we have those candidate crystal structures, we're also interested in their materials stability. That means we want to know what does that material do at, cons at, at finite temperature, pressure, and at different chemical potentials. Because we want to help the experimentalists tell them, hey, how do you actually synthesize that? Can you directly arc melt it? Do you have to have some complicated diffusion process to actually get to that phase in the phase diagram? Or do you have to stick it in the diamond anvil cell? And so that requires free energy calculations. He found this nice illustration by a former student in our group uh, about a cluster expansion. And the different cluster expansion codes, such as the CELT tool, the CASM tool, and ATED, one of the original ones. And of course, for phase diagrams, we also want to know melting points and other things. And there's other types of Monte Carlo calculation of the MD simulations, such, such as in LAMPs, to figure these things out. Once we go through that whole process, we talk to the experimentalists. We tell them, this is what you should use for the processing conditions. And now they can synthesize the hopefully new superconductor. Occasionally, we're right, and it works. In the case of W diboride, we were not right, but it still worked. It was just a superconductor which had a different mechanism. So the success rate so far has been close to 50% of finding something interesting in the experiments after we've gone through at least part of these steps. We haven't really put it all together in as nice a way as I'm illustrating it here. So I want to talk a little about the crystal structure prediction, because this is one of the slowest parts. Uh, well, there's a lot of slow parts, but it's one of the ones we have actually ideas of how to accelerate that. So we've developed over the last, it's probably by almost 12 years or something like this, the genetic algorithm for structure and phase prediction. And one of the nice features is that it was from the ground up, de desi ground up designed to be grand canonical. Grand canonical means we're directly searching over composition space. You can bound, bind that, bound that to if you want to do an, a certain part of the composition space, uh, but in, it will always give you competing phases and everything else if you wanted to. Uh, so genetic algorithms take crystal structures, combine them with genetic operations, such as uh, crossover, or you in, uh, individually change the structure by mutation, and then you locally optimize those structures through relaxations. That's relatively cheap in DFT. You go to the nearest local minimum in the basin of attraction, and uh, the energy landscape, the genetic algorithm actually optimizes is actually the stepwise function because the relaxations take care of this part. And the goal is to find the ba basin of attraction of the ground state. This is how the genetic algorithm works overall. The structure relaxation energy evaluation with the VASP or other external codes is where the computational cost usually lies. And this is what we want to accelerate by machine learning. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask Jason here to tell you about one method of data augmentation how we accelerate uh, these genetic algorithms. Thank you. So what I wanted to do was take this workflow of the genetic algorithm and add an additional step. And what I wanted to do was remove this situation where we go directly from the pre-evaluation to the structural relaxation and energy evaluation. So I wanted to remove this step and add a step where we predict the whole distance of the material with some form of a machine learning algorithm. And with this predicted whole distance, we want to check it against some predefined stability criteria. And if this material does not meet our predefined stability criteria, we simply discard it and remove the situation where we're running a redundant DFT calculation. However, if it does meet the stability criteria, then we continue the algorithm as uh, standard. Now, what I'm showing here is the typical workflow to develop one of these machine learning algorithms. For the specific model we trained, we used the materials project database, which consisted at the time of about 132,000 crystal structures. We then generated our, an additional test set from a genetic algorithm structure search, which consisted of about 600 structures from the niobium strontium hydride material system. Once we had our data set, we had to decide how we were going to describe our material to the machine learning algorithm. Now, typically, the two approaches were to either apply a symmetry invariant transformation to the, coordinate, the atomic coordinates of the material we would evaluate. The issue with the uh, invariant transformations is as we increase the number of elements contained within our training and uh, test set, the dimensionality of our descriptor really scales quite poorly, which makes it infeasible for us to be able to make a machine learning model that could, out of the box, make predictions across the periodic table. Alternatively, we could use a compositional-based embedding. And with these compositional-based embeddings, we've seen decent formation energy predictions, showing a couple of examples here. But specifically with the genetic algorithm, 
The uh, materials we produce come at very uh, discrete compositions. And with the compositional-based embedding, we're unable to distinguish between multiple metastable states that have the same composition. So what we needed was a machine learning model that could capture the structure of the material as well as uh, capture elements across the periodic table without suffering from the poor scaling of the typical invariant transformations. And this came in the form of the crystal graph convolutional neural network, which instead of using some mathematical formulation to describe the uh, material you're evaluating, it instead built a graph structure and uses this graph structure to define the architecture of your neural network itself. And with these uh, graph-based models, we've seen a continued decrease in formation energy predictions. But there's a subtlety here in that the predicted errors are typically reported only on relaxed structures. And if we want to use these models for screening for thermodynamic stability, the prediction errors or the metric that's actually relevant for us is how these models perform on unrelaxed structures. And what you often see is tucked away in the supplemental material of these papers is that they do in fact check this and say that we perform well on relaxed structures. But when we try to apply them for the relevant structures, we have about an order of magnitude higher prediction errors. So what we wanted to do was firstly understand why these models perform so well on the relaxed structures, but so poorly on the unrelaxed structures. So we generated this data set, trained the crystal graph convolutional neural network. And what I'm showing here in the blue and the orange is the uh, prediction results over the course of training for my unrelaxed structures in my test set and the relaxed structures. And what we see down here is there's a strong anti-correlation, meaning that as the model was getting better at predicting the formation energy of relaxed structure, it was actually getting much worse at predicting the formation energy of these unrelaxed structures. And when we plotted uh, the predictions versus the DFT computed formation energies, we found something quite interesting. And that is not necessarily that we had these high errors, but there was a systematic overprediction. And what this tells us is that predicting structures formation energy, sorry. Predicting a structure's formation energy when it's at an unrelaxed configuration, it's really a qualitatively different task than predicting a structure's formation energy when it's in an unrelaxed configuration. The reason being is that when a structure is in an unrelaxed state, it is higher in energy. And when we train the model on relaxed structures only, what it's doing is trying to extrapolate and predict a material that we're giving it that is actually in a higher energy state to be higher in energy. So what we needed to do was develop a way to tell the machine learning model that instead of predicting the energy in the current state, we want to make the prediction of what the structure will, the energy of the structure will be once we allow it to relax. So from the work of one of my uh, former lab mates, Shreyas Hanare, he found that if he took the data from a genetic algorithm structure search and took the relaxed structures and unrelaxed structures, computed a, the descriptor and simply mapped them to the relaxed energy, he was able to make high fidelity predictions of the formation energy. The issue with the model that I wanted to develop is that we only have act, well, we were using uh, the materials project database, which consists uh, almost exclusively of relaxed structures. The unrelaxed structures still lie quite close to what the relaxed state would be. So we wanted to figure out a way to make the materials project database, all of the structures within it, look as though they were produced in a genetic algorithm structure search. So to do this, we first ran a few uh, structure searches and got a distribution that looked like this. And this is showing just the average distance that atoms move during relaxation. We then took this distribution and the relaxed structures in the materials project database and randomly perturbed the atomic coordinates of this structure to try to emulate what a GA produced structure would look like. We then took these structures in the perturbed state and mapped them to what their relaxed energies would be, essentially taking the potential energy landscape and presenting it to the machine learning model as a step function. And with this, we were able to correlate the uh, relaxed and unrelaxed structure predictions to really quite a high degree. And we were able to uh, improve the prediction errors by about, about a factor of three. Now, the last thing I wanted to do was see how this model would actually perform in accelerating a materials discovery campaign. So what I did is I took the known competing phases from the materials project database and constructed a convex hull. I then defined 10 stable materials who had a uh, we're either on the convex hull or below the convex hull based on what was on materials project. And on our data set, we had 10 materials that met this criteria. 
We then varied what our predicted uh, whole distance stability criteria would be, firstly, to account for the prediction uncertainty, and secondly, to allow us to generate this ROC curve. And what we found was the model that was trained on the augmented data set was able to obtain perfect classification with a uh, predicted whole distance stability criteria of about 40 MeV per atom. And at this uh, stability criteria, we have a false positive rate of about 20%. When we compare this to the model that was trained on only relaxed structures, we see that it needed uh, a uh, predicted whole distance criteria of around 600 MeV per atom to get this perfect classification, and it had a false positive rate of about 80%. So what we see here is that training with the, an augmented data set yielded about a five-fold reduction in the number of redundant DFT calculations. We, we published this in uh, MPJ computational material. You can read more about it there. Uh, what I want to say here is that this artificial training uh, took about, artificial intelligence training time took about five hours. We're then able to take this workflow where we go from materials project to the machine learning model and implement through GASP to make our uh, stability criteria predictions in about a second per structure. With that, I'll pass it back to Richard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. So this is the first example of how we can use AI machine learning to accelerate structure predictions. And this is something we're currently implementing in the GASP code and make available through our GASP GitHub repository. In the second part, I want to talk about uh, another way of accelerating the machine learning, and that came out of the idea that in the genetic algorithm, we generate all these relaxation trajectories, and we usually, in the past, throw them all away, because we're only interested in the relaxed structure as for the pool to make new structures, and then in the end, we're only interested in the structure on the convex hull. So there's a lot of loss of good information, and all that information could be used, because it's a pretty broad sampling of the energy landscape, to make a good machine learning potential. You've already seen these kind of slides before that we start with many body theory, go to DFT, and then we can map it on a classical molecular dynamics using some interatomic potential. And we want to do that part with machine learning because that can be much more accurate than it can be with empirical potentials. I think I also, Jason had some of that already in, in the slides he just presented. Uh, I'm going to skip that too. And I want to just jump right in to what we've been looking at in our specific type of machinery potential. There's always an accuracy speed trade-off, and we've already seen slides like this before. What I'm showing you here is for the BCC tungsten data, published by Gabor Zani in 2014, that contains a number of configurations, about 10,000 configurations for primitive cell, bulk cells, some surfaces, some vacancies, gamma surfaces, some dislocation quadrupoles. And what we have done with various types of classical potential and machine learning potentials done a fit where we've taken 20% of that BCC tungsten data to kind of emulate what happens when we have small data sets like we often have in the GA early on during this, uh, this process. And we left the remaining about 80% in the benchmark for testing. We refit a Lena Jones, a Morse potential, a SNAP, QSNAP, GAP, and a moment tensor potential. And we're comparing that also with the two methods I'm going to tell you more about later, which is the ultra-fast force field methods, only having a two-body term, or having a two and a three-body term. And so, when you look at the empirical potentials, and I want to point out the EEM potential was not refit, we've tr not for trying, but we couldn't get a good fit. And it's, it's an example of uh, having a student who had 20 years of training, uh, it is a, still more of an art to fit a good empirical potential in the amount of time frame we gave ourselves of about a month, uh, and so for EM, that didn't work. For Morse and Leonard Jones, that was much simpler. These are simpler potentials. And, but you see, these are nice, fast potentials. They're great for MD simulations of large systems. But the error bars may not be useful. Uh, when we go to current types of machine learning potentials, they fix that error. That error is very useful. And here, all these potentials do somewhat comparable. The moment tensor potentials is a little faster. Snap and QSnap is quite accurate. Gap is more accurate still, but reasonably expensive. And then our ultra-fast force fields, which is just a two-body term. This specific version is actually a little faster than the Leonard Jones. That's probably because of the cutoff we used. And when we add the three-body term, it gets significantly more accurate of the same scale as these other machine learning potentials, but it still has one to several orders of magnitude gain in speed. I want to also point out that uh, this method, which we uh, uh, put together in 2019 at the 
IPAM workshop is actually very similar in spirit to the stuff Ralph has presented, and so you will see some of the analogies, what's similar, what's different in the approach. So we had a couple of motivations and goals, and I want to highlight them here, and I'm going to come back to some of them as we move along. First, we wanted it systematically improvable, so we start with that exact same many-body expansion of energy landscapes that Ralph nicely explained in his talk. We really felt like a real space description of structures by looking at distances R, A, J between atoms is an ideal representation because when you look at any molecular dynamics code, it says this is the one property the molecular dynamics code already has. So we, wouldn't, we wanted to avoid any use of any kind of Hermit polynomials, other YLMs and other kind of functions uh, because that's an extra calculation we didn't want to do. Uh, so we think that going to directly to the distances should help with speed and it also should help with interpretability uh, of the potentials. Uh, we felt like that one of the other important aspects is if we represent it as a function of distance and apply any functions to it, we'd like those functions to not scale with increased resolution. We wanted to use something which has a compact basis so that the number of function evaluations we require in the end does not scale with resolution. So we use a compact and smooth basis function. These are going to be B-splines. And then in the end, we want to turn the problem into a strongly convex optimization problem because we really do not like local minima. It is terrible when we optimize and we have to re and re-optimize from different starting configurations to get to a better minimum and still not know that we are at the best minimum. Uh, and so this will help with uh, speed and the memory efficiency of learning. So I'm going to show you that these flexible spline-based potentials we have are accurate, fast to fit, fast to evaluate, and easy to interpret. We do not have holes in our energy landscapes and we're going to show you that also in practice in a little bit. So we're using a many-body expansion. You've already seen this in a much nicer graphical form in Ralph's talk. I really should have an illustration like you have in here in the future. And so we have the sum of two-body terms, three-body terms, all the way to n-body terms. We have that implemented, but we've really only tested the two- and three-body terms ourselves yet. So in other words, if you go to our GitHub page and try it out, uh, and you try the four- or five-body term, don't be surprised if there's still bugs in that. Uh, the assumption is that these terms are uh, transferable to various atomic configurations. That assumption often works if you stay in a certain composition or parameter space, but it may fail in some cases. And so we want, in the end, so these potentials be interpretable. Here's a two-body potential. Here's a three-body potential. And I'll show you how we do that. So we have those two and three-body potentials. I'm truncating them. These two and three-body potentials on a given data set will have to do the job of any higher order interactions that there are, and they usually do a pretty decent job. We expand the two-body potential in a linear sum of basis functions, which now have to be compact and smooth, and we're using B-splines for that, and we're using the distance as a parameter in there. So the cubic B-spline basis we're going to use, it's illustrated what these B-splines look like. It has a local support. That means for every distance, I only have to evaluate four of those B-splines, and so my uh, cost of the potential is completely independent of the resolution, making those knots closer together, Still, four evaluations of B-splines per distance. I don't have to pay anything. They have to have a smooth first derivative because all of us like forces, and we want to have a continuous second derivative uh, so that we can also trust the four knots at almost any point. And so here's the equation for the B-splines that we're using for that. So the two-body term now simply consists of that local energy decomposition as a sum of those two-body terms. Here's what the B-splines would look like. The nice thing is with the B-spline basis, we can automatically include smooth cutoffs at, for example, large distances. The potential goes smoothly to zero. And when we, uh, if we want to figure out how much resolution we want, we figure out how many spline knots we have. And so the number of basis function directly controls the maximum local curvature of our B-splines. Here's an example of what they look like. This is a radial distribution function, and this is, I believe, for tungsten. You can see that they have the typical form smoothly going to zero. We make sure they have a repulsive core at the origin to make sure that atoms do not get too close. And then they might have a couple of wiggles in between and a nice local minimum typically near the nearest neighbor distance. We also have three-body terms, and the three-body terms are written out in a very analog analogous form. And Ralph already mentioned that, that you can do tensor products of uh, your essentially the basis functions, these are our two-body terms, and we just have a tensor product of three uh, one-dimensional B-splines, and that gives us a very general expression for describing any function in a three-dimensional space here. Here's that 3D tensor spline, and here's kind of what, what these things look like. We can visualize that immediately. We know what they look like. And when we optimize them, this is just an unoptimized initial version, we can directly plot where are these potentials repulsive, 
where are they attractive? Are there any holes in it where they become too negative or something like this? Do we need to regularize them more? And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about next. Here's the visualization. You can actually take cuts to that and represent it as a form function of angles. And you will see at what distance and angles is my potential attractive or repulsive. And you can start interpreting that. Does it try to penalize an FCC or HCP structure for BCC tungsten? Or does it try to favor the BCC structure because of the three body terms? All these things are directly visible for the user. And so here's what that looks like, for example, for BCC tungsten. You can see these different kinds of terms. Uh, an important aspect, especially when you deal with small data sets, like you often do in genetic algorithm, and you have a large number of potential parameters here, is to regularize your uh, a machine learning model. You want to avoid overfitting, illustrated here. That's a terrible potential. It actually goes negative as short distance, has all these wiggles in that. And the nice way we can implement that in our linear regression method, because it's a strictly convex problem, we can use Tikhon of regularization. And we actually do two regularizers. The most common one most people use is a rich penalty, which penalizes any coefficient of your potential. It tries to drive the coefficients to zero. And there's often a good reason for trying to drive coefficients to zero, because you make your model simpler. In our representation, it is a terrible idea to drive the coefficients to zero. And the reason for that is, if you look at the potential here, it, here between those two points, there may not be any distances showing up. And the potential goes very quickly to zero. That's not what we want. We want a potential which smoothly goes through those points. So rich regression for the two-body term is something we immediately turn off. We are not driving our potential to zero just because there was no distances in our data set. Instead, we're using a curvature penalty. This is just illustrated here in the Tikhon of regularization. It's very simple to get second derivatives, third derivatives, fourth derivative into the regularizer. And the reason we can do that is that we have the representation as a function of distance and these very compact, simple b spline bases. So there, your potential is going to go smoothly between those points, connecting them, minimizing the curvature in between them, gives you a potential just like we expect for two-body potentials. For the three-body term, we're going to do both curvature and rich penalty because we want to penalize the three-body term to not do as much work as the two-body term. We'd like to have the lower order body terms to dominate the overall interaction, unless we know, like in cases like silicon where angular dependent terms are important. And so then you have to change your regularization. So I'm going to switch over now again, because I want to show you, or I want Jason to show you, uh, how we can actually do that in practice. And Sorry, Richard, so for that. Yeah, I mean, there's a good time to ask the question because Jason has to Yeah, yeah, so, so. And switch over. Let me actually help these switch over part. What's the question? Um, just so, so then, so the curvature there is applied to the radial coordinates. These radial coordinates. Or is it, is it Probably need to be floor? close. Oh, no, that microphone works. It's, it. it's on the. You're, you're, you're working with spherical coordinates. No, we're only working with distances. So what we're working on is with your central atoms. Okay, so, so you have atoms at certain distances, that's your pair term. And then for the three-body term, you have pairs of atoms at certain distance. They have a distance between each other. There's a triangle. And then I get a, a term which has a one distance, one distance, and an angle in between. And we express it as a tensor product of the three B-spline coefficients along this direction, this direction, and that third direction. We go all the way to 180 degrees. OK, so the curvature is of the functions in the underlying tensor. The curvature of the function in 3D space is actually the curvature along those three distances in real space with the real distances. Or they can turn that into an angular curvature, if you want to. There's no YLMs in our, in our method. Okay. They take too much time in our mind. That might be wrong, but uh, does it answer? I think so, yeah. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll, I'll, I'll we'll talk, talk later. I'm yeah, yeah, here yeah. for the long program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is just go through a quick demo of how we actually develop and design and train a UF3 potential. I just have some quick statistics here. And what you'll notice is that the pre-processing, essentially loading the data from our DFT calculations, takes about 10 seconds. The featureization, this is a bit of the bottleneck, takes about 2.4 core hours. So beforehand, I ran this on about 16 cores in parallel. It took about 15 minutes. Then what you'll notice is that the training and evaluation of our test set takes about two seconds each. And it actually takes more time to plot the results of our predictions than to actually make our predictions. So we're going to be using the data set that Richard previously described, where we're training on 20% and evaluating on 80%. Now, the first thing we need to do is just define to the potential what elements it's modeling and the degree of the many-body expansion, with a degree equal to 3 telling the potential that we're going to capture both 2 and 3-body interactions. 
We have a couple different cutoff, uh, hyperparameters for the feature, featureization. The only thing I want to note here is that we do, in fact, have explicit control of what cutoffs and what resolutions we have for each specific interaction that our potential is going to be trying to learn and model. So we'll run this cell, just a couple blocks to load the data that uh, defines our 80-20 test train split. We then initialize our B-spline basis set and parse our uh, training data. And what you're going to see is what we give to our featureizer is a simple pandas data frame that consists of the geometry of the structure, the energy, the forces in the x, y, and z direction, as well as the number of atoms within the unit cell of the material. And then we simply run the featureization. This is the block that would have taken about 15 minutes to run. Uh, and all we're doing here is featureizing the, the data frame we just gave, the, uh, the, the code snippet, and saving it to an HDF5 file. Now, we define our regularization uh, dictionary, which consists of the ridge penalties as well as the curvature penalties. Initialize our model, and if we run the fit and the predictions, we see it takes about two seconds to do the fit, two seconds to do the predictions. Now, what I want to do now is try to describe how we can incorporate the pi iron framework to do rapid prototyping and testing of our machine learning potential. So what I've done with this code is exported our model and generated the necessary files to load our potential into LAMPS. The next thing I'm going to do is simply define a potential in uh, the pi iron framework while loading a uh, predefined structure so this takes a couple seconds to run because this structure right here consists of about 8,000 tungsten uh, atoms. And what you're going to see is it has both a solid and liquid interface uh, contained within the material. Give it one second to load. Yep, there we go. So this is the material that we'll be running the LAMP simulation on. If we scroll down here, you can see we've already initialized the job. We're running a simple MD uh, calculation at about 4,000 Kelvin for uh, 300 time steps. And what we see, if we actually take this potential and run, is that it actually fails. And this is uh, one of the really key features of UF3 is that when our potential fails, we can quickly look into the potential and see what might be the possible reasons that the potential fails. So if we plot the two-body term, we see something very similar to what Richard uh, presented in the previous slides. And we see that our two-body term is essentially functioning how we would expect it to. But then when we inspect our three-body term, what we see is that the magnitude of the forces uh, that are contributed by the three-body interactions are really dominating our potential. And this is kind of the opposite situation of how we want our potential to form, uh, perform. But the solution is rather simple. Because we're able to see that our three-body term is dominating our potential, we simply increase the regulari regularization associated with the three-body interactions, refit our potential, check our, check our three-body term, and we see that now the magnitude of the forces are more within uh, reasonable uh, values. Now we can take this potential, redefine it uh, again in the pi iron framework, take our potential and run a calculation for about 300 time steps to confirm that our potential is actually able to run an MD simulation. And give it a second to run. And it completes and we can see here with the built-in animation from PyIron, that our potential is performing how we, should, we would expect it to. Then the last thing I want to do is describe the melting point calculation in the PyIron framework. So we took this potential that we just developed here and ran it through Jan's melting point calculation. This was a really uh, kind of a complex workflow. So our potential went through about 330 individual uh, LAMPS simulations. And with that, I'm not going to run that here, but I'll simply load the results, and show the final plot. And what we see is the, the potential we just trained was able to obtain a melting point prediction within 5% of DFT accuracy. And what I want to conclude with is by looking at the potential that wasn't even able to run 
300 time steps in lamps. And what we see here is the difference between the potential that failed and the potential that was able to go through this complex workflow. There's only about a 5% improvement in the force prediction errors, whereas we actually got a little bit worse in the energy predictions. And this really tells us that the force and energy errors are really insufficient to determine whether or not we have a functional potential. And one of the key features of UF3 is because of its interpretable format, when our potential fails, we can look into the potential and see why our potential isn't functioning as we expect. With that, I'll pass it back to Richard. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's switch back. Okay. Oops. So I want to just briefly summarize some of the other properties. So the potential Jason showed had not exactly the same parameters we have for the optimized potential for tungsten. I'm showing you now the cutoffs are slightly different, but it's very similar. Uh, and so these potentials fit with a three-body term, have very accurate uh, phonon spectra, the two-body term, which is, uh, uh, has also very similar phonon spectra, so it does well there. These were not in the training set. When we compare to some of the other methods like uh, MTP, SNAP, Q, SNAP, and GAP. So this is now different properties in that radar, spot show, uh, radar plot shown. Here's UF 2,3, uh, so including the two and three body term. It does quite well across all these properties, and it's certainly no worse than some of the other machinery potentials trained on the same amount of data. Uh, if you train the, uh, these potentials on larger data sets, they will certainly do better. So we'll probably do our, our potential as well. Uh, we've already heard about the melting point. The example Jason had for the melting point with a slightly different cut of hyperparameters was about 5% too low. The example we have uh, uh, in the paper for the U of 2,3 is, is about 5% too high in melting point. And that compares quite well also with the just two-body potential as well as with the MTP snap and gap potential. And remember, uh, these simulations are of the speed of uh, Leonard Jones, slightly faster than Leonard Jones. This is about the speed of EM. These certainly uh, take a little bit more time in comparison. So this is very useful. I don't have to show you that video. We've also just want to show you a couple of illustrations that it does well also on other materials. This is the MLearn data set. Uh, Pavan Prakash and our group had looked at that. UF3 is here on top. And just by looking at the color scheme, you can see that it does very well on these uh, uh, metal systems. It does a little worse on silicon germanium. And here are some of the other machine learning potentials. It doesn't do dramatically better or worse than any of them. They all fall into the same ballpark on this specific type of data set. So they're comparable in accuracy at a fraction of the computational cost. I have an example here where we actually show if we use this potential on the lithium germanium system. It was an example I showed you earlier where we knew there's one new phase. And we're going to do, look at a very specific type of question. Here's how the GA algorithm ran without UF3. That was just the DFT algorithm. And so getting the convex hull. And what we're doing here in that specific test case is we split that data set into two groups. We said, what would happen if we just know all the structures up to eight atoms in the unit cell and train on that, and then use the UF3 to now make predictions on the larger cells uh, up to, in this case, 20 atoms. And this is a very common use case we envision, where we do a genetic algorithm on a small system and say, that's we can afford. It's fast because it's order and cubed in DFT. And then we're going to go to, let's say, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 atoms and predict this UF3. So how does the accuracy transfer? So if you look at that, the error on the small unit set training is excellent, 7 mil electron volt per atom. And I want to point out here, is this is a very diverse set of structures. These are not all the same crystal structure. Many of them are structures, when you look at them, like, this is hideous, right? They're very ugly structures. But it gets a pretty small error. And when I look at it now, applying it to the large unit cells, the error certainly goes up. It's now 27 mil electron volt. But it, this is extremely useful. If I would have had a machinery potential like this and would have just looked at these ground state phases down here, I would have easily saved an order of magnitude on the DFT equation by not having to do that. So in other words, uh, this UF3 can help us significantly accelerate the genetic algorithm structure prediction over the uh, data augmented part, which we can do on top. Again, we can visualize these things immediately. Two-body terms, you can see them here. Here's the three-body terms. You can try to see, is it really what you expect? Do you not like them? Is that maybe a little too wiggly here? Well, increase the curvature regularizer. Make it smoother and stuff like this. This is something the code immediately prints out at the end of every fit. And uh, it's up to the user then to decide what they like and don't like if it is the right physics. 
Uh, that framework is available on GitHub. You go to github.com slash uf3. Here's a picture of some of the developers. The GASP Python code is also available, written in Python, so we're actually interested in coupling these all together as well as coupling it together with Pyron. And uh, point out that we have some data sets available on our materials web, and then we used, in this case, the QMML data set for tungsten. So what I've shown you now here is that artificial intelligence can really help us accelerate some of our workflows. In this case, training time was about two seconds. Uh, the workflow was we start with GASP and VASP to generate some structures, then go to UF3, then go to LAMPS to make sure that we have the right melting points, good structures, etc. Uh, we use PyIron now for the workflow from now on in the future, at least for UF3 to LAMPS for sure, and we'll probably going to use it also for some of the other parts. And the runtime to do these kind of melting point simulation and other things, uh, other kind of property calculations, of course, is now very fast in LAMPS, so of the order maybe minutes in that sense. So I'm pretty much out of time, right? Let me just show you one last slide that uh, on the last project, uh, we've also done some uh, symbolic regression for our superconductivity learning where we said, look, can we actually improve on the Allen and Dines equation uh, from the mid 70s, which was fitted by being clever and using some very limited data set, especially since this, uh, Allen and, the Allen and Dines equation doesn't do so well for some of those high temperature, uh, high, uh, high pressure hydride superconductors. And we used some data augmentation method and then uh, the CISO code to come up with some new prefactors for the Allen and Dines equation to significantly improve its prediction accuracy for high temperature superconductors, conventional electron phonon superconductors. And so in this case, that was using CISO, tra training time of that is about a day. The workflow in that case was we started with the literature, we did some quantum espresso and EPW calculation to get some uh, alpha squared Fs and then the uh, 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 critical temperature. We did a data augmentation here where we said, oh, these electron phonon coupling calculations are too expensive. Let's just make up some spectral function using a sum of Gaussians and run those through the EPW code. And then took that, took that augmented data set, ran CISO through it, and ended up with that new equation. And with that new equation, of course, you can now plug that equation in anywhere and it takes about 100 nanoseconds or something like this to predict TC if you have uh, the, the right kind of ingredients for it. So I'll stop here. I'll show you the final slide where I hopefully shown that in our workflow, AI and machine learning and using things like PyIron can really help us accelerate it through data augmentation to get the relaxed energy of unrelaxed structures, always a mouthful, uh, ultra-fast force fields to really uh, explore the energy landscapes more efficiently, and then symbolic regression to do some property prediction, maybe somewhat more efficient. Thank you very much for your attention.